I have in my hand, I'm about to have in my hand, a paper, and it's a paper about egalitarianism. And let me just tell you what this is about. And this is, this is beginning to be a little bit of a buzzword in churches, um, and you might be hearing more about it as time goes on, but the bottom line is that this is about women preachers and women elders, okay? That's what it's, that's the, that's the trend, and that's where this thing is going. And so, uh, in this paper, there's this statement to begin with, within Christianity, a movement based on the theological view that all people are created equal before God, and there are no gender-based limitations of what functions or roles each can fulfill in the home, the church, and the society. And so uh, the movement is one where uh, gender does not influence what people do. So let's look at this for a little while tonight, especially let's look at what God's Word teaches. And let me ask you to go to Genesis chapter 1 with me. Genesis chapter 1, because it's very important for us to realize that all people, meaning both genders, all races, all colors, all, uh, all nationalities are precious in God's sight. Let's see how it all got started. Genesis 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Notice the us there because God, this is the Godhead, meaning the Father, the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the, and when he says men there, or man, he's talking about humanity, okay? Um. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, right away we know that that male and female are equally precious in God's sight. And the scripture that I often quote when I offer the invitation, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4, how that God desires all men to be saved. That word men there means all people. It means male and female. God desires that everyone be saved because everyone is precious in God's sight. Gender is God's idea. And I refer back to Genesis 1:27 again where he said, let us make man in our image, and, uh, and, and male and female created them, uh, created mankind, and so gender is God's idea. It's not that some committee met somewhere and said, hey, why don't we divide humanity up into uh, two groups? Um, one will be one gender, one will be another gender, and nowhere in the scripture does it say uh, that if anybody decides they want to be another gender uh, than the one in which God has created them, you know, that that's, uh, that that's uh, okay, and God's all right with, he's okay with that. And we're supposed to honor God by sticking to uh, the, the gender in which he has, uh, well, you can't actually change your gender, but we're supposed to honor him by by being comfortable with and, 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 um, and cooperating with God by being the gender and living according to the gender that God is creating us to be. Now, the scripture says in Galatians 3, 28, that there is neither Jew nor Greek in Christ, there is neither bond nor free in Christ, there is neither male nor female in Christ, which simply means that we're all uh, uh, equal. But notice that he says that that he does distinguish the genders there, male and female. Here's a very important point, and that is that we are of the same value as male and female to God are the same value, but we have different roles, and those roles are very important. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, and we're going to look at, we're just going to be reminded of some things that we're already very familiar with, but these things need to be reviewed from time to time. So I'm in Ephesians 5, 
And I'm looking at verse 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, this scripture goes on to teach that it's very important for husbands to treat their wives with honor. And that's, that's, that's taught, uh, and we'll look at more of that in just a moment. But we see that, that people have different roles to play. And then here's one, ladies, that's a little bit hard for the ladies to read. This is 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm beginning in verse 8. And, uh, and, and some people say, well, the Apostle Paul didn't like women. Well, there's no evidence of that, but uh, he does teach some things as he's led by the Holy Spirit. And some of these things are showing that, that we have different roles to play, that women have a one role and men have another role to, to play in life and even in the church. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, which I am suffering, even to the point I'm in 2 Timothy. I'm sorry. I, I didn't think that felt right there. All right, here we are. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. Now, apparently he's talking not about mankind there as much as he's talking about males in particular. Because in the next verse he says, I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And ladies, we always point out that it's not wrong to fix up and look nice and to wear some bling and things like that. He's just saying, I want you to be about more than just the outward appearance, okay? Verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Now this doesn't mean that you can't have a lady for a boss at work. He's talking about in the church. He's talking about like in church services and, and so forth. Verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness and propriety. Now what does that verse mean, verse 15? You know, we don't know exactly what that means, except I can tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that a woman can have a baby or two and be saved or double saved if she has two or triple saved if she has three. That, that's, that, that would be inconsistent with what the Bible teaches because the Bible teaches that everyone, male and female, must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. It could mean that women are saved because the Savior was born of a woman. And therefore, women and men can be saved because a child was born. And of course, we were talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Backing up to verse 13, Adam was formed first and then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, we've studied this before from Genesis chapter 3. I want, you to, I want you to notice that it was the woman who was deceived, but it was the man who chose to deliberately sin. He was not deceived. He just went along with it, with, with the lie that the serpent was telling and with the eating of the forbidden fruit. He knew he was doing wrong. He wasn't deceived. He did it on purpose. So both of them became sinners, both the male and the female. But he said the woman was deceived. Now, spiritual leaders have always been men. And when I say that, I'm talking, but let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going we're gonna to look at uh, where the scripture talks about the fathers or the patriarchs. Hebrews 1 verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir over all things and through whom he made the universe. God spoke <clears throat> to us, to mankind, through the fathers, through the patriarchs in time past. And if you look at the Bible carefully, you will notice that 
priests and prophets and elders and deacons are men. Now, yes, you can find, if you really, really want to try to find it, you can find sometimes a word translated priestess or prophetess or something like that. It sounds that might make you at first think that uh, there were some. There was a woman judge, of course, Deborah, but the, but the spiritual leaders have always been men. Even though sometimes through translation it might seem like that there were some females who were who were uh, spiritual leaders as well. Now we do know that women are very spiritual, and we do know that women are uh, are leaders in, in many many ways, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But the scripture teaches in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that elders are to be men, husbands, and that deacons are to be men, and they're to be husbands too. And so it's, I think it's very important for us to realize that spiritual leadership has always been put upon the shoulders of the male. Now why is that? I don't know, except I have a theory, and this is just a theory, okay? Okay. I think women are generally more spiritually reliable than men are. I think men tend to be weaker and when it comes to spiritual values. And that's why, and I think that God forces men to be the leaders in his church. Because if God didn't force men by saying, I want men to stand up and lead, I, I'm afraid and I think that too many men, most men in the world would just stay back and let the women handle it. And, uh, you know, that's the way we are in our homes. You know, the more we get our wife to take care of us, the more we're going to let our wife take care of us. And we're just, we're just going to let, we're just going to allow the women to do as much as we can get them to do. Well, if that was true in the church, then pretty soon it'd be like that church I told you about once in, in Wyoming that wrote me a letter after getting one of my fundraising letters. And they said, it was written in, in longhand, female writing, and it said, so you want us to help you. We wonder if you would be willing to help us. We are a church of four women. We have no men. Now, some of them had husbands, but the husbands were, you know, they just didn't, they weren't spiritually minded, and they weren't, they didn't attend the church services. They didn't attend worship. And so the women had to handle it alone. Um, and I wonder if most of the church wouldn't be that way if God didn't say, I want men to preach. I want men to be elders. I want men to be deacons. I wanted my prophets to be men. I wanted my priests to be men. Men, I'm expecting you to lead. And so men get up there and lead and do the right thing. And it's very important for us to realize that men are incomplete without women. You know what the scripture says in Genesis 2.18? First of all, we read that God made mankind male and female, but he made the man first, as we already learned from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And then he said, Genesis 2.18, it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, but it's very important for us to realize that God is saying it's not good for a man to be alone. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. We see Paul writing to the church at Philippi, and he's... And he's um, He's saluting certain people, and, and uh, a lot of these people that he's saluting, he's calling by name, and these are women, women in the church that he has relied upon because they've been of a, a tremendous help to him. And now I'm going to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5. And we're looking at verse 14. Let me just start in verse 11. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when uh, their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they, then they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry and to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no place for opportunity or no opportunity to slander. Notice what he's saying there. He's saying that I need women to take care of things that men are not good and won't do. Like, well, they can't have children and they can't manage a home well. 
and so he says he says that I'm I'm depending on on the women to do certain things while men do other things. Now here's something that I think is very important for us to realize, and that is that that a great deal of um, of respect is necessary in order for males and females to 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 fulfill their specific roles that God has given them to fulfill. Um, women have an amazing role to fill or roles to fill and men just need to be in awe of women and all that they can do and all that they're able to do not only to have children but but to, it's like today at lunch we were watching uh, Mandy Middlebrook uh, pick up two children at one time two little boys I, you know, I wouldn't doubt she couldn't pick up all three of her kids if she really wanted to you know but but she it's just amazing and if young women are so well they're just all women Younger women and older women are all just amazing. And so R-E-S-B-E-C-T is very, very necessary. Let's go and look at Ephesians chapter 5 again. And we're going to look at um, some attitudes that we're to have toward each other. Ephesians 5.21 Submit to one another. Now, I know that this is talking about male and female respecting each other because of what he's about to get into starting in verse 22 submit to one another out of reverence for Christ in other words out of respect for Christ ladies honor your men as men and don't expect them to act like or think like women because they can't they're not supposed to men honor the ladies as who Christ who God made them to be in the particular roles that they have. They're not supposed to think like men because God didn't make them that way. And we need to have that kind of respect. And then here's Ephesians 5.25. I told you we'd get back to this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself after all no one ever hated his own body but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church for we are members of his body for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. He's just using the husband and wife to, as the example of Christ and the church. However, verse 33, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And then he talks about how that parents are to respect their children. Listen to this. First of all, children are to respect their parents. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. And since wives and mothers are to cooperate with the fathers as the head of the home, fathers are, then that means that parents are not supposed to exasperate their children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And then there's 1 Peter 5.5 5 that says, let us all humble ourselves before each other. Let's not be proud. Let's not be haughty because God rejects the proud and the haughty, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, that is a sermon right there, just that one slide. And I could talk a long time about that if I chose to. It's very important for us to realize the next point, and that is that everyone is a leader by example, whether male or female. So may I tell a story one more time that I've told before. It goes back to the days when I was a, a young 25-year-old preacher. Well, that's, that's redundant. Young and 25 means the same thing, right? When I was a 25-year-old preacher at Rogersville, Alabama, and I would meet with the elders on, uh, on Monday nights, and we would talk about whatever we, we wanted to approach next, whatever uh, initiative or new challenge we wanted to embrace as a church. And then 
once we decided we were going to do it, then one of the elders would almost always say, we need to get Miss Odell in here. Now, Miss Odell was Odell Norton, and she was uh, Dr. Ledbetter's head nurse. Not only that, she was the ladies' Bible class teacher. She was also the lady who wrote most of the skits and the, and the plays and the things we did, like the little dramas and the, and the acts and things that we did. Plus, she planned the fellowship parties and all kinds of things. She was an amazing lady, and she had a lot of influence. And you see, the elders knew that a bunch of guys just deciding that the church was going to do something would not get it done. Without the cooperation and the involvement of the women in the church, it's not going to happen, okay? It's just not going to happen. And so they knew that, and they knew that the best way to do, uh, to, to get it done, to get the women involved, was to get Miss Odell, who was loved and respected as a, a leading lady among the ladies, and if they could convince her that this was a good idea, and that this was something that needed to be done, and to the glory of God, and that it would, it would result in somehow, some way in heaven being enhanced by more souls being saved, then, of course, they'd go along with it. So it was, it was always... Uh, it was always recognized that while men are charged with having public leadership, women have a, a very, very important role to play. As a matter of fact, men can't seem to get along well and do well without women. And so respect, again, is what we're talking about. Everyone is a leader by example, if nothing else. So that's why the Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. That means male and female. Both genders are to do good to all people, especially, he says at the end of that verse, of the household of faith. In other words, we are to put our church family first, but we're not to draw a line at the, at, at the door of the church building and say we only help ourselves and we don't help others. No, we're to do good to all people. But that's a matter of male and female. And then the scripture talks about this, and I know I mentioned this last month as well, in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, it says... Be very wise toward those on the outside. Now that means that male and female Christians are to be very mindful of those who are not yet Christians, who are watching us, observing us, observing our, our attitudes, observing our behavior, observing our faithfulness, observing our dedication. And so everyone can lead in this way without having a title. You don't have to be a male. You don't have to be a female uh, to, to be a, a leader in this sense. I always tell kids when I'm talking to young groups, uh, young people, uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask a little boy, I'll say, uh, who are you leading? And he doesn't know. Maybe he's six years old. And I'll say, you're leading the four and five-year-olds. They're looking at you and they're watching you because you are where they're going to be next. And they're, all, and they're always looking at, at, who, at the kid who's just a little bit older than they are because they know that's where they're going next. And so all of us are leading all the time. We're leading by example. We're leading by conduct. We're leading by attitude. It's very important for us to notice that. So egalitarianism. Uh, that, that's, uh, you know, we talked about traditionalism in my class this morning. Here's another ism tonight. And it's about a growing movement where women are being either welcomed or sometimes expected or maybe even forced sometimes to lead in such a way that God intended for the male to lead. And now, do I think that this is going to take over the Brotherhood of Churches of Christ? No, I don't. It might be that you'll hear about a church or two in, say, trend-setting states like maybe California, maybe Texas, maybe around Nashville, one or two, but that, 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 then that'll be it. 20 years from now, I don't think preachers will have to get up and say, folks, we got to be concerned about egalitarianism and about how that uh, there no longer are no limitations as far as gender is concerned. I think it'll play out, and then there will be some other things that'll come along, as they always have, and I suppose always will. But right now, uh, we're, 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 we're hearing more buzz about it, and so I just thought I'd mention it for a little while uh, tonight and to just remind us that God has always intended for men to lead as far as the church is concerned, but, it, but he's always uh, also always intended for uh, everyone to be treated with respect and that everyone is precious in his sight 
whether male or female. And I almost want to open it up for questions, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I probably couldn't answer the question if you asked one. Because you can, you can get into some hypothetical situations and that just really are not worth getting worked up over, such as women passing the uh, trays and things like that for communion. The best thing to do is just to stay away from hypothetical situations. Just know that women are not to preach publicly. And we always say that while men are the head, the women are the neck. In other, in other words, they're, they have this, this amazing influence, especially over their husbands. Women are to respect their husbands because God has given them the responsibility to lead in the church. It's very important that women allow men to lead the way God intended. But men are not to be misogynist. And a misogynist or a chauvinist is someone who tends to have less respect for females than he does for males. That's wrong. That's sinful. God never intended that for that to be the case. But he wanted all of us to, to be treated as if we are made in the image of God because we are. Whether we're female or male, all human beings are made in the image of God and are to be treated with respect. Okay. Hopefully the, the point is made. Now let's move on now to the plan of salvation which you see on the screen which teaches us if we want to be saved we must be willing to hear the gospel and believe it, repent of our sins, confess our faith in Jesus, that we believe he's the Son of God, our Savior, and to receive baptism for forgiveness of sin. Now, if you've obeyed these commands already, but you need the prayers of the church, as Christy came forward this morning, we invite you to come forward and ask the church, to, your church family to pray with you and for you. You'll never find a better time than right now to ask the, your church family to pray for you. If you are a Christian, you've obeyed these plan, these these commands on the screen, but you feel as if you have drifted away from the Lord, the good news is He'll take you back. As a matter of fact, He's reaching out to you. He'll, he'll, he'll take you back as many times as is necessary to save your soul. So it could be tonight that you need to be restored, rededicated. You need to come back to the Lord as a Christian who's drifted away. Whatever your need may be, this moment of invitation is for you. If you need to come to the Lord, come now while together we stand and sing.